Kevin mentioned, my name is Brianna Lyric, and I'm a scientific program manager at the Institute for the Advancement of Food and Nutrition Sciences, also known as IFINS. For those of you who are not familiar with IFINS, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that engages scientists from academia, government, and industry to advance food safety and nutrition sciences in support of public health. We believe that including diverse perspectives is fundamental to the development of rigorous, credible science. This session will consist of a series of short presentations by our invited speakers, followed by a moderated panel discussion. Our goal for this session is to have a dialogue and engage directly with the audience. So if you have questions or comments for the speakers, we encourage you to submit them at any time in the questions box in the WebEx control panel as Kevin uh, showed us. And then lastly, before we begin, I'd like to note that this session was organized jointly by IFINS and the Toxicology Forum. IFINS was invited by the Tox Forum to co-organize this session following our original webinar on this topic in late 2020. So we very much appreciate this invitation and are happy to be here today. And with that, it is an honor to introduce the moderator of this session, Dr. Johanna Dwyer. To call out just of the few of just a few of the many hats that Johanna wears. She is Professor of Medicine and Community Health and Director of the Francis Stern Nutrition Center at Tufts Medical Center. She's Senior Scientist at the Jean Mayer USDA Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging, a contractor at the NIH Office of Dietary Supplements, and she has also served as a member of the Council of the National Academy of Medicine. Johanna also served as editor of the review journal Nutrition Today for over 25 years. So thank you for joining us today, Johanna, and I'll hand it over to you to introduce our first speaker. The session will begin with a series of short presentations from each of our speakers, and it'll be followed by a panel discussion with everybody. And we really look forward to your questions. I'm going to introduce each speaker in turn, and we'll save all the questions for the panel discussion in the second half of the session. So we'll have plenty of time and save your questions. First up is Dr. Marsha McNutt. Um, do, uh, Dr. McNutt is a, a geophysicist and the 22nd um, president of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, prior to coming to NAS from 2013 to 16, she was editor in chief of science uh, journals. And she was also the director of the U.S. Geological Survey from 2009 till uh, 2013. She's a fellow of the American Geophysical Union um, and also of the Geological Society of America and the uh, AAAS and also the International Association of Geodesy. Um, Dr. McNutt holds her PhD in Earth Sciences from Scripps and uh, a, a baccalaureate degree in physics from Colorado Col College. Marcia? Great. Thank you so much, Joanna, for that <clears throat> introduction. Uh, I was going to say on this uh, intro slide what my potential conflicts of interest might be, but uh, fortunately, you just explained them. Uh, I approach this uh, problem of correcting the record with wearing three different hats one from the USGS uh, time as a user of sound science. Um, secondly, as editor-in-chief of science, uh, I had to deal with a lot of issues that required correcting the record. And then finally, as president of the National Academy of Sciences, where we work to improve the science uh, enterprise. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, so we, we all agree that retraction um, in some sort is an essential tool for correcting the literature and preventing flawed research from having a deleterious impact on progress of science, the application of science to sound decisions, and of course, public trust in science. But retraction is clearly a crude tool with shortcomings. First of all, there's a stigma associated with it that isn't always earned when the retraction is for an honest mistake. And it can take years to get flawed research retracted. 
And we've seen examples of that, for example, in the uh, Wakefield paper in the Lancet. Um, so my argument uh, that I'm going to make in this talk, for those of you who sort of lose interest before I get to the end, is that it's preferable to build self-correction into earlier stages of the research process through increased transparency, emphasis on quality, built-in checks and uh, replication. And I've put um, on this slide as my sort of poster child for uh, problems. Um, this uh, was uh, this time article referred to a pair of papers that were published in science in 2004 and 2005 with multiple problems rapidly surfaced, data falsification, fabrication, IRB process, informed consent, authorship, it was all on pluripotent stem cells and uh, it led to loss of public trust in science. Now, issues impacting the trust of science, if I could have the next slide. Um, this is, uh, I don't know if we can get that little video to play. You might have to click on it or something. Um, this is just a, a paper that looked at um, actual misconduct and then a book by Richard Harris on um, irreproducibility. Misconduct is rarer, um, but clearly happens and affects trust and um, also will lead to retractions. Um, irreproducibility is another issue, which um, I'm not going to talk about too much today because some cases where a paper fails to be uh, reproduced, it may warrant a retraction, but it may not because science may simply have moved on uh, past some statute of limitations. Uh, and I'm sorry we didn't get that video to play, um, but uh, it just showed the incidence of misconduct around the globe and demonstrated that some of the nations that are most um, recent um, scientific, um, uh, more, more recent scientific enterprises have the worst um, uh, record with misconduct. If I could have the next slide. Uh, now, um, Reproducibility and retractions are all related to um, scientific trust. And this is a sort of um, uh, an approach I like to use to represent the scientific process when I'm talking to non-scientists. That there are actually three different issues in science. One is the scientific method. And the scientific method is the most proven self-correcting approach for revealing the laws governing the natural world. Scientists explicitly and implicitly and fully trust the scientific method as um, their way to um, get us closer to truths. Then at the top of this giant Jenga game, I don't know how many of you have played Jenga, but um, at the top of this tower is the scientific consensus. And each of these logs in this tower, I think about as individual studies. And a scientific consensus is built brick by brick on top of, of these individual studies. But an individual study is just that. It's subject to confirmation and revision. And when you start not trusting individual studies and start pulling the bricks out of this giant tower, eventually the tower collapses and the scientific consensus needs revision. We call that a paradigm shift. And um, so the scientific consensus, the scientific method we trust always. The scientific consensus is only as good as the studies it's based upon. And if too many individual studies which led to that consensus are proven to be false, then we need a new consensus. So um, too many, uh, people who are not scientists confuse an individual study with the scientific consensus and with the scientific method. And we must do a better job in educating people on the difference between these. If I could have the next slide, please. So let's look at the barriers to correcting the literature, to correcting these individual studies and therefore indicate that a consensus may need revision. First of all, it's difficult to retract papers. It's time consuming. There's often self-interest involved or some institutions don't want to investigate because of reputational risk. And there's also stigma associated with a retracted paper. And even when papers are retracted, 
they continue to be cited and not cited as having been retracted. And I um, reference here an article um, that showed that um, uh, citation of a fraudulent clinical trial report kept being cited 11 years after it was retracted for falsifying data. And this is not, unfortunately, uncommon. If I could have the next slide. So um, this was uh, one study that I had to deal with when I was editor in chief of science. It was a study on how to change attitudes on gay marriage and the data had been completely falsified. The fraud in this case was uncovered primarily because two young researchers at um, Berkeley, uh, uh, Brookman and um, Kyla, were unable to recreate um, the first author's sample return rate, so they got suspicious. I could have the next slide. But um, what made retraction difficult was that the first author, who was a graduate student at UCLA, refused to agree to the retraction in the case of incontrovertible evidence that he had falsified many statements in the paper beyond just the data, IRB approval, who funded it. The paper was downloaded more than 100,000 times before it was retracted, and we actually did an editorial retraction on it without his um, approval um, because of the damage that this paper was doing. Uh, and as I say, complex questions were raised about the fact that um, uh, when uh, his co-author, Don Green, who was at Columbia, asked about IRB approval, LaCour was able to successfully claim that IRB approval was confidential to UCLA and his co-author had no right to see it. Uh, so that was a major problem. If I could have the next slide. Well, what went right on this was that um, the senior second author um, immediately asked for a retraction when the student failed to produce the original data for him. But he didn't ask for the data until after these two Berkeley uh, researchers um, flagged the paper as suspicious. It was retracted by science within a month, within a few months of publication. And um, what's interesting here is the researchers who uncovered the error redid the study correctly and confirmed the result. So in this case, we were retracting a paper that wasn't even wrong, even though it had all sorts of uh, errors. They had never, the, nevertheless had gotten to the right answer. Um, so, uh, you know, this led to um, a very uh, damaging article that was um, published in The Economist about uh, troubles in um, reproducing scientific research, fraud, misconduct, et cetera. Um, it led a number of us to write a, um, an article in science to promote increased transparency and openness in research, to recognize elegant excellence in reviewing and provide more incentives for putting effort into reviews to create at least two classifications for retraction, distinguishing honest mistakes from fraud or deliberate um, uh, errors, and improve language in conflict of interest declarations to make them more complete. Uh, we went on later. This is a paper that we published in PNAS uh, with Kathleen Hall Jamison, Veronique Kiermer from PLOS, and um, Richard Seaver from Cold Spring Harbor um, to uh, talk about the need for clear and accountable retractions, broader categories of corrections, um, again, including uh, voluntary withdrawals, easily found for agenda and errata um, so that people don't have to dig to find them, forward and back links. So um, forward links from the original paper to the correction or the retraction and back links from those to the original papers uh, with retracted on them and promote use of tools like event data. For those of you who do not know what event data is, this is an innovation from Crossref, which captures um, other activity like online discussion platforms, social media, um, uh, that, uh, you know, um, on uh, say retraction watch, et cetera, that captures other activity and can be a hub for the storage and distribution of this data. Uh, next slide, please. Um, now, in trying to classify retractions, there have been a number of schemes uh, produced. Several papers, as I've said, have said um, 
uh, to have two types, uh, honest mistakes versus um, true uh, um, purposeful errors. Um, but who decides which term to use? And there have been a number of ontologies which have been um, suggested um, all the way from uh, a five tier system of um, deciding uh, when uh, a paper needs to be self withdrawn or removed or retired or canceled or whatever. And if we have too many classifications, will the negotiation end up obfuscating the errors? And so what are we trying to optimize in this? Is it speed? Is it transparency? Is it the integrity of the record? Or are we trying to get author cooperation in all of this? Uh, so, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, there is a, a report uh, issued by the National Academy of Sciences on fostering integrity of research that, among other recommendations, calls for a creation of a research integrity advisory board to become an organizational focus for best practices and standards. In response, the National Academy is standing up something called a Strategic Council for Research Ethics, Integrity, and Trust, and David Allison, who will be speaking later, is co-chairing it with me and Franz Cordova. Um, this board is charged with identifying, anticipating, and prioritizing key challenges to research ethics, integrity, and trust, and it will serve as a venue for stakeholders to advance collectively the integrity of ethics, research, and effectiveness of the research enterprise, including everyone from funders to research institutions to researchers um, to uh, publishers and to final uh, users of the data. So I'd say the end game that we're going for is to design self-correction into research from the very start, to educate students how to perform and document reproducible research, to share information that is well documented openly, to validate work in improved ways uh, beyond reproducibility to generalization and independent verification using alternative methods, uh, forward and back links to replication, creating tools to make self-correction easy and natural. If you make doing the easy thing right, then people will do it, and fundamentally shift the culture of science to honor rigor rather than sensationalism. And these are all topics that will be taken up by this new strategic council. So that's it for me, and thank you very much. Oh, thanks so much, Marcia. It was just wonderful. And you deserve a, the President's Medal of Honor for handling that, that case when you were over at Science. Our second speaker is uh, David Allison. And Dr. Allison's Dean and Distinguished Professor and also the Provost Professor at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana, uh, at the School of Public Health there. In addition, uh, David is currently co-chairs the committee that uh, Marcia just mentioned at the National Academy on uh, Research Excellence, Integrity, and Trust. And he's also been continuously funded by NIH for uh, almost a quarter of a century now. He's authored about 600 publications and a lot of that research uh, teaching and also his writing uh, focuses on promoting rigor and reproducibility and transparency in scientific research and communication. David, let's hear from you. Thank you, Johanna. Let me thank the organizers for inviting me. It's, it's a privilege and honor to be here uh, in general to offer you, you know, to have the opportunity to offer some thoughts and to be part of such an esteemed panel. Um, science is self-correcting, but only if we make it. This is not a new idea. It is an idea others have advanced. Um, People like James Heathers and Tim Brown have articulated it well, as have many others. There's nothing magical about science that makes it self-correcting. It's self-correcting if we, the parts of the community, the human elements of the community of scientists, of science, make it self-correcting. And the challenge is that many people resist that. Uh, I'm not going to read this to you. This is my disclosure. But the important thing is here at the bottom is my email address. and. If anybody wants my slides, they can email me and then it'll have that and they can read it themselves. All right, so what are the challenges to self-correcting literature? One of the challenges is that, as Marcia indicated, there are many different types of problems in science, and it's almost certain that they should not all be considered and treated identically. 
and there may be different ways to prevent um, problem, those problems from occurring and then for dealing with them when they do occur. And they range from fabrication of falsification. By the way, these are not new. So any romanticized view that these are new results of some new incentives in science are simply not true. Um, if you look at the work of Gregor Mendel, it's fairly clear that by today's standards, he fudged some of his data. It's fairly clear that by today's standards, uh, Pasteur, uh, without disclosing it, which is worse, um, hid some of his data. Um, and with disclosing it, which is better, Eddington um, didn't hide, but didn't utilize some of his data, which allowed him to confirm <clears throat> Einstein's theory, which is again an example of him getting the right answer, but the right answer through ways where we might say, gee, you could have equally supported Newton's work if you just had included that outlying observation and did he do the right thing? There are people who made honest mistakes like Rene Blanlon, who thought he invented or discovered N-rays, N for Nancy. N-rays don't exist, and this was later shown. It seems that he made an honest error, um, albeit maybe perhaps we might say in retrospect kind of a, a, a chump error, an amateur error, whereas Linus Pauling made a very sophisticated error when he thought that DNA had a triple helix because given that he was a um, anti-nuclear advocate, uh, anti-war advocate. He, his passport was taken away by the government. He could not go during the McCarthy era to the UK and see Rosalind Franklin's good X-ray crystallography data. And because of that, he was confused. He thought DNA had a triple helix. He published that first in PNAS before Watson and Crick published the correct double helix. That paper has never been retracted because it's thought to be an honest error working at the edge of leading science and that that's part of the scientific process. That's a normative error as opposed to blanc lance, which might be called a non-normative error. Um, there are substandard methods. There's a great reference here, reference number four, um, which is at the back, and where um, using sloppy epidemiology and sampling that even 100 years ago would have been known to be sloppy epidemiology and sampling led to mistakes about the size of thymuses that were normal and thereby um, normal children getting their thymuses and thyroids irradiated uh, and resulting in uh, cancer. And then finally, there's just plain weak science where it's not wrong, it's not fraudulent, it's not a quote unquote mistake, but people use old outdated methods or methods that never were good enough in the first place, whether they've been outdated or not. Um, to lead to unreliable progress and conclusions. All of these things are very different. We need to deal with them differently. Some of my colleagues and I put out something which you probably, some of you have probably seen called Obesity and Energetics Offerings. And if you haven't seen it, I hope you'll sign up. It's free. It comes out weekly in which we put out information about obesity and energetics with a particular focus on methodology and integrity and, and uh, re rigor, reproducibility and transparency. And in the process of doing so, we often see papers. And as that paper comes out, often I'm the person flagging it and I say, hey, this looks interesting, um, but I don't know if it could be true. Could this be true? And I will send it around to my postdocs and my mentees and my colleagues. And very commonly, the email comes back and says, no, it can't be true. Uh, there are mathematical errors and inconsistencies here. There are mistakes. The analysis is wrong, um, et cetera we can't figure out what's done. And we started writing letters to the editor. And sometimes these letters resulted in things being corrected. Sometimes they resulted in rapid retractions and that was admirable. But often they resulted in editors not responding to us at all or telling us that we needed to pay a fee to publish or authors trying to obfuscate and deny things. So Nature heard about this and invited us to submit this paper on the left reproducibility of tragedy of errors, which we did describing these things. And then over on the right, you see a recent editorial we published where my colleagues and I opine, and uh, I will say that I strongly believe that editors serve as a key linchpin. They are not, journals and editors are not the only place where we need to buttress rigor, reproducibility and transparency. But I think they may be one of the key linchpins where we could have the most immediate progress and I also think that editors are one of the key players in which, from my personal subjective anecdotal point of view, 
I see the least commitment to stepping up courageously and doing the right thing. Now, that's not uniform. There are some editors who are great, but we see a lot of editors who are confused, um, who just want the problems to go away, who have no idea what to do, um, who try to hide things and bury things and block things and just don't seem to want to rigorously step up and ensure that the scientific record is maintained. What are the impediments to correcting errors? Well, journals don't always want to publish uh, or allow post-publication discussion of errors. You can see some quotations there from Andrew Gelman's blog in which he talks about these experiences, and we've had the same experiences. We've had journals tell us, we just don't publish letters to the editor. Um, that's just it. Uh, we've had situations where authors lack of supplying an appropriate letter response has blocked our letter from being published. So, for example, we submitted a letter pointing out a mistake in a paper. The journal's policy was to always allow a response from the original author, which I think is fine and wise. They did so, and that original author then made um, ad hominem personal negative remarks about me in their letter. The editor then correctly, in my view, said to that author, we don't accept ad hominem personal remarks, stick to the science. The person said, I don't want to remove those remarks. The editor said, well, then I can't publish your letter. And I said, well, go ahead and publish mine. And the editor said, I can't publish yours if I don't allow the author to respond. Uh, and that seemed to me an absurd catch 22. You can really take it to the limit. What if the original author had died? Would we not allow a correction to a paper because the original author was deceased and could not respond? Those are clearly unwise things. Uh, sometimes journals just don't respond at all. We've had to, we've collaborated with authors where they acknowledge their response. The authors themselves and us jointly author a letter correcting something. And then we've had the editor not ever respond to our email and we've had to put it in pub peer as an alternative. There may be time limits. We've had errors being considered unimportant if they don't change the conclusions. And we say, but if an analysis is wrong, the result is unreliable. And even if the result doesn't change when we correct the analysis, a wise reader knows first that the results are unreliable and that they can't be relied upon for policy and blue ribbon panels and meta-analyses and so on. So it's important to correct it even if they don't change conclusions. Um, and the last thing, which is I think the hardest, is editors seem to struggle between what, what we call a deterrent, sort of a, a demarcation problem between demarcating between differences of opinion, like I think it would have been better if you measured your outcome variable this way versus that way, versus just plain wrong, like you divided by zero. That's just plain wrong. And this is a slide on that demarcation problem. The classic use of the phrase demarcation problem in science goes back at least to Popper. I'm not sure if it predates him or not, uh, but Popper talked about demarcating between either science and non-science or science and pseudoscience, sort of alternatively. No one's ever really fully been able to solve that demarcation problem, but we think there's another demarcation problem that's closely related but not identical, and it's demarcating between weak or flawed science on the one hand and plain old-fashioned incorrect science on the other hand. And so again, by example, my example is if you, if you add one and one and you get three and you're doing ordinary math, that's just plain incorrect. Um, if you uploaded the wrong data file, that's just plain incorrect. If you scored your outcome variable backwards, that's just plain incorrect. Whereas if you uh, use this anxiety measure versus that anxiety measure, we might argue over which is better, but it's not necessarily plain and correct. And editors seem to have trouble, especially on statistics, distinguishing between plain old fashioned and correct, meriting correction, and differences of opinion. And so they're often their attitude is let the let the uh, author and the letter writer hash it out. Let the reader decide. And that's unfair because the reader probably doesn't have the statistical expertise to make that decision either and it doesn't truly correct the record. Authors uh, and editors often fail to act fully. This is one example where we published a letter in response to a methodologic paper on cluster randomized trials. We showed that 
um, the statements were wrong. An independent statistician agreed with us. The authors, like the authors Dr. McNutt talked about earlier, refused to retract their own paper. The editor, of course, had the authority to retract the paper, published this whole story, including that an independent statistician agreed with us, but then ultimately did not retract the paper. So the paper sits there unretracted, even though the editor in his own journal has written publicly that the paper is wrong. This is one in which we submitted a letter to the editor indicating that the analyses were just plain wrong, but literally impossible. Analyses were done, which should have zero degrees of freedom. Um, and the response from the authors is, although we appreciate their, meaning our, expertise, we respectfully submit that they may not be fully familiar with the challenges of designing and implementing community nutrition education interventions in kindergarten through sixth grade, which I would completely agree with. I'm sure that I don't fully understand the challenges of implementing such a study, but I have no idea what that has to do with the fact that the statistical analyses had no degrees of freedom and were just plain wrong. And let, letting this sit out in the literature uncorrected, I think is a black mark on this journal's integrity in our field. This is another rather curious case. Again, a cluster randomized trial is one where we see a lot of things. So we just sort of created a theme here. Paper was published. The analysis was shown to be wrong. The journal pub retracted it. You see the retraction on the left. And then on the right, the authors then took the same paper without changing the analysis and submitted it to a new journal, which then published it. When Retraction Watch contacted the editor of the new journal, Pediatric Obesity, the editor said he was unaware of it, but then no further action was taken. So again, the original journal acted responsibly to retract, but now the second journal has published the same flawed paper with no correction. All right, so those are just some examples of the challenges we face. What do we do going forward? How do we make things better? And I think that what we really need to do as the scientific community overall, we need to get the NSF and the, the ORI and the National Academies and others behind us and try to promote systems in which papers are spot checked in the peer reviewed literature. I think if folks know things are getting spot checked then we can fix some errors, we'll know how common errors are, we'll know where the levers are to make errors better and it will provide an incentive for reducing errors. Such programs could be funded by NSF or ORI. Indices of correction could be promulgated. What, get me what gets measured gets worked on. So once journals start to get ranked on their rigor of correction, instead of just impact and citation counts, then I think they'll start to pay a lot more attention to correction. I can tell you I'm on the editorial board of several journals, and boy, we spend a lot of time at editorial meetings talking about our impact factor and everything we can do to get those up should we publish these kinds of papers and not those kinds of papers? Because we'll get more citation counts because that's what people rate us on. But if people rated us on how rigorous are you in correcting errors, I think we'd be having a different conversation. And finally, funding for prevention. And I'm clearly biased as a statistician, but I think that having more statisticians involved would be helpful. And so I think funding for prevention for statistical support and training is really vital. Um, I'm not going to go through this because of time limits, but here's an interesting role of what can other independent panels supply. Marsh has done a great job of talking about different kinds of retractions. Here are my thoughts. I think we really need to change the culture. I think we need to get people to begin thinking about science as just an absolute, unequivocal, sacred profession. It's a vocation. It's not a job. And part of that sacred vocation is an unwavering commitment to the unvarnished communication of truth. As John Lennon said, just give me some truth. Thank you. It was wonderful, David. Thanks again. And we'll come back, I'm sure, to many of uh, these uh, issues as we go forward into the discussion. Our next speaker is um, Dr. Brian Nosek. Dr. Nosek is the co-founder and executive director of the Center for Open Science, you call it COS, which uh, enables open and reproducible research practices worldwide. And Brian's also a professor 
in the Department of Psychology at um, University of Virginia. He co-founded Project Implicit, uh, a multi-university collaboration for research and education investigating implicit cognition. And research applications of this uh, interest include implicit bias, decision-making, attitudes, ideology, morality, innovation, barriers to change, open science, and reproducibility. In 2015, uh, Brian was named one of Nature's 10 uh, and to the Chronicle uh, for Higher Education's Influence List, and he received his PhD from Yale. Uh, Brian, take it from here. Thank you very much, Johanna. I'm delighted to be uh, part of this panel today on uh, this important topic and with uh, the other panelists who have been doing incredible work in this area. I'd like to pick up on where uh, David's uh, talk left off, which is the need for considering a change to the research culture. Uh, and I'll couch that in the context of what we mean when we talk about science is self-correcting. In the most general sense, we're referring to something that's very ordinary and very fundamental to the scientific enterprise. And that is that we recognize that science at present is an imperfect representation of reality. We know that our models, our methods, our approaches, our findings, our claims, our conclusions are all incorrect or incomplete or flawed in some way for representing the much more complex reality that is out there. And so when we are self-correcting, we are questioning our current understanding, revising it with improved evidence and updating that to some better understanding of what's going on out there in the world. So retraction and the dramatic examples that David uh, raised uh, is an extreme form of self-correction in a process that otherwise is totally ordinary and what we're doing every day when we do our work. So in the context of the research culture, what I'd like to consider is what is it that we do in setting up the system of incentives and rewards and norms to encourage or discourage self-correction from operating as effectively and efficiently as it could. And we've had many discussions uh, across different scientific communities over the last decade of challenges for self-correction, challenges for reproducibility, research credibility. And those by and large are situated in discussions about how the research culture may reward behaviors that lead us away from obtaining and promoting credible findings, credible research, and correcting the record. And there are many issues that we could tangle with in terms of what are the challenges in that research culture. For us uh, at the Center for Open Science, it boils down to a key concern. And that is in academic science, the incentives for my success are focused on me getting it published, not on me getting it right. I advance in my career to the extent that I produce publications and produce them in the highest uh, prestige outlets that I can. And of course, I want them to be correct. I want to find things that are true and supportable and reproducible, but I'm not directly rewarded for that. I'm rewarded for exciting findings rather than mundane ones. I'm rewarded for finding positive results rather than negative results. I'm more likely to be rewarded for finding novel results rather than increased information or evidence about a prior claim. And I'm more likely to be rewarded if all of my findings are neat and tidy and fit together, rather than having exceptions and things that don't quite fit and parts where I have to say, well, we just don't understand why we observe it this way. So a positive, novel, tidy story is the best kind of story in science and the most publishable one. And it is the best because if you discover something new and have a complete, compelling explanation of it, that is an amazing contribution to science. But as we all know, that doesn't happen very often. Science progress is halting, it's incomplete. There's lots of dark alleys and blind alleys and misdirections and changes and things that don't fit. And that emerging understanding over time of a positive novel, tidy story with an explanation covering all 
takes many iterations uh, to get to over many years of effort, rather than in the reward units of paper to paper to paper. So what we set up is this potential conflict between what's good for me is certain kinds of findings, and what's good for science is reporting everything and showing what it is we're finding, where it's going wrong, and encouraging others to correct uh, what it is we have done and what have we found. So that to may be at the root of many of the challenges for both credibility and ultimately self-correction. So if I'm incentivized for novel, positive, tidy results, then that incentivizes me to only report those things that are novel, positive, and tidy, and to ignore the negative results, to dismiss my findings that don't fit with the conclusions I want to draw as flawed. Don't even bother putting in the paper. It also incentivizes me to conduct questionable research practices. I can analyze my data multiple ways. Some of those ways may look better for publication than other ways. And I may not intend to, but I may unintentionally rationalize to myself that the ways that look better for publication are in fact the right ways to analyze and report that data. And while I value the concept of transparency and sharing in principle, because I'm not directly rewarded for being transparent with my work, there's no reason for me to do the extra work to make my data more available, to comprehensively report on my methodologies so that you as a reader uh, could critique and help self-correct uh, whether I got it right or not. And of course, if the rewards are focused on novelty, on innovation, on pushing out boundaries into new possibilities rather than verifying what we think we already know, then why would I bother uh, doing a replication of somebody else's work? And why would I even bother doing a replication of my own findings? Once I get a finding, if I try to replicate it, then all I can do is lose it. And that means losing the rewards that I could get uh, for publishing that. So those behaviors ultimately create challenges for the credibility of the published literature because we are selectively reporting, exaggerating the apparent evidence for those things that we study. And we're not making the data and methodology available to help others to be able to reproduce, to be able to critique, to be able to replicate those findings. And we don't have what are fundamentally some of the mechanisms for self-correction in general, transparency and sharing of those data, materials, protocols, and conducting replication studies. And those things all together then produce waste and slow our overall progress. So the context because of all of that reward system is that we don't have as efficient a self-correction process as we could. And this is far beyond just the notion of retraction. It encompasses the entire range of the research life cycle. Prior to something being published, for example, we already know that peer review is unreliable, that it's ad hoc, that you know you get the three right experts, it'll get accepted, you get three others, they may disagree and it won't get accepted. There are all kinds of gaps in that, but that's not really the key issue for self-correction. That's, that's an issue to address, but for uh, many other reasons. The key issue prior uh, to publication for self-correction is that as a reviewer, you don't have enough information about how I did my research and what I found to actually review it in a way that would reveal some of the challenges. You get to see the paper, my report, my summary of what we did, how we did it, and what we concluded. Uh, but if you saw our process and you saw that in fact, the five experiments that I put in the paper were really the five that worked from a sample of 50 experiments that we did, then you might have a different evaluation of the paper knowing those other 45 experiments weren't reported. If you were able to access the data, you might, and the analysis code, you might look at how it is we report on it and say, wow, you said this thing, but you actually did this other thing in your analysis strategy you may not have recognized. And so part of the self-corrective enterprise is like what Marcia had said earlier, is promoting the broader transparency of the entire process so that self-correction actually has a chance to occur. And then after publication, David summarized the many painful things that occur of trying to get uh, self-correction to occur. It's slow, it's difficult, there's no rewards for someone going into and trying to correct uh, the record. And uh, Marsha mentioned earlier that 
even retracted articles keep getting cited. Here's another example from Barlon and Halevi. They looked at a, a 311 articles that were had been retracted because the findings were not trustworthy. They're scientific distortions. You cannot trust these findings. This is showing you from October 14th through December uh, 2017, how many times those 311 articles continued to get cited, where all of them had been retracted months to years prior uh, of October 2014. And these are not all citations saying, oh, you shouldn't trust this finding. They're just citing the paper as the findings in support of the argument for the next paper. So even the most extreme form of self-correction, retraction, if that isn't sufficient to self-correct, then all of the ordinary parts of self-correction, where they're just the debates that occur in the literature, the trying to investigate and dig deeper into findings, are going to struggle. And in fact, it, it brings up Brandolini's law, which is the amount of energy needed to refute bullshit is an order of magnitude larger than to produce it. And we can understand that in seeing the examples uh, that David pr provided of how hard it is, even just to get something that is clearly incorrect, corrected itself uh, in the literature. So let me just close reinforcing some of the comments already made about ways that we can improve self-correction. The first and primary is that as a systems challenge, how we reward, how we set norms, how we set policies for how science is conducted is where a lot of the challenges for self-correction occur. Because any individual scientist may really believe and want those self-correction processes to work well, but if the system of rewards and incentives does not align with that, our ideals will not get manifest in behavior in the way that we would like. And so we have to engage these challenges with systems level types of solutions. And there are many different places in the research life cycle where we can inject that possibility, such as pre-registration or register reports early in the research process, in allowing and incentivizing even conducting of replications, improving transparency of the whole process, and making the process of challenging, correcting, withdrawing, retraction, an ordinary one where editors have a tool set rather than just uncertainty of, I don't know how to deal with this and I don't like the contentious nature of it, but rather a process that they follow, that they're trained on and they're supported by so that they can do these things effectively. Thanks very much uh, for the time and attention. Uh, we'll be delighted to hear the rest and engage in discussion afterwards. Thank you. Brian, thanks. It was just great. We're really grateful for your presentation. And our last speaker is uh, Patricia Brennan. Dr. Brennan um, is director of the National Library of Medicine at NIH. She's a leader in biomedical informatics and data si uh, science research. And as you know, NLM um, oversees a vast literature resource uh, for our country that spans uh, 10 centuries now. And that includes uh, print and electronic resources used billions of times each year by millions and millions of people worldwide. Dr. Brennan has a Master of Science in Nursing from Penn, University of Pennsylvania, and a PhD in Industrial Engineering from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Dr. Brennan is a member of the U.S. Uh, National Academy of Medicine, and she holds fellowships in the Academy of Nursing. Uh, the American College of Medical Informatics, and the American Institute of Medical and Biological uh, Engineering. Uh, Dr. Brennan, let's hear from you. Thank you very much, Joanne. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And it's always delightful to be on a program with Brian. He prepares the world for the things that I would like to be able to say. Um, next slide, please. I'd like to, first of all, as, as a federal employee, I have no disclosures to make and move on to my, my remarks. Next slide. So I'm here to provide with you the NIH and the NLM perspective on the two challenges that we were faced with today, the challenges that exist when attempts are made to, to correct the scientific re record, and what is needed to build self-correction into the scientific enterprise as a whole. I'm going to actually be spending a little more time on the second of these objectives, because what the NLM does is we work across the research life cycle to improve 
the conduct of science, the stable and effective ways of tracking science and then reporting it. Next slide, please. The National Library of Medicine is perhaps familiar to many in, in this audience. We are on ma maximum telework still, so these buildings are empty in front of you, but we continue to produce our key, key resources and meet our mission each day. The mission of the National Library of Medicine was codified in 1956 with the statement that we should acquire, disseminate, and preserve the biomedical knowledge of society and make it useful for education and the public. Now, the biomedical knowledge of the public of, of society is changing as society changes. So our challenge of coming through as a library is to both reflect what is known and move on to what needs to be known as we build our resources. We do, of course, preserve literature. We also conduct research on the best ways to access and display and demonstrate the literature for the public to use. Today, this I'm taking this an approach that because this topic is particularly important to the NIH. Next slide, please. Because fundamentally, the NIH is about creating evidence for research and practice and then getting, getting that evidence into research and practice. So it's critical that science be self-correcting because that cycle is getting tighter and tighter. The change, the rapid development of new approaches to scientific communication is almost outstripping our ability to acquire preserve and make it accessible through indexing. And in order to make sure that these rapidly emerging new approaches to scientific communication have the integrity that reflects the proper understanding of phenomenon and its relevance to society, we must build in self-correction throughout the whole research cycle. Next slide, please. At the National Library of Medicine, we really focus in three key areas to improve the self-correction, of the, the, the literature, the scientific literature, and to, to address the challenges. Our literature resources, perhaps most familiar to those of you, are organized under the PubMed Bibliographic Data Repository, 32 million bibliographic citation records, and the PubMed Central, which is our full text manuscript repository, where we are we now allow investigators and authors to append to their PubMed Central manuscripts data sets, protocols, executable files, which it all together improves the exposure of science and therefore allows a greater scrutiny and the opportunity for, for correction if needed. It also, though, frankly, makes it much more challenging to figure out when we change a content in an article, we have to make sure that the data set is updated to reflect the, the, the corrections in that article. When we modify the connection between an article and a genomic sequence, we have to make sure we keep those records consistent and, and organized well. NLM does support the retraction of journal articles when the journals give us the okay to do the retraction. We have slightly different strategies for doing that. Certainly journal errata are particularly important. We also, in both of our re resources, both PubMed and PubMed Central, we provide banner as well as XML tagging of articles that have been retracted so that we maintain the record as is our basic mission, but we identify its current status. Now, the NLM also does two other activities that are, I believe are critically important to creating a science that is self-correcting. First, we manage specialist research repositories. Those research repositories include our vast genomic and molecular data repositories and our clinicaltrials.gov registry of clinical trials. These each have slightly different contributions to the, the self-correction of science, and we need to put in place strategies that allow us to correct them. For example, we accept genomic data deposit from investigators around the world. We do a process of curation at the point of that data being deposited to make sure that the data are accurate and in fact reflect the phenomenon that is expressed to us. But we also allow our investigators to reach back to us and tell us a sequence that was deposited may need to be modified. While we retain the original sequence, we provide the modified sequence to the public so we keep the most current view of the data available. Clinicaltrials.gov, I'm going to go into in a little more depth in a few minutes because it provides us with a very specialized way of what I believe is connecting the digital objects of research in a way that will make it easier to implement the self-correction or the correcting activities that we need to cover. 
But I want to take a brief moment to talk about terminological support, which is something that the National Library of Medicine does to make sure that the phenomenon we capture at the point of observation, whether in a clinical trial or in a genomic study or in a public health epidemiological approach, are labeled in a way that is tractable, understandable, and interoperable across many data sets. Improving the self-correction of science will require us to have data that are stable, that are labeled clearly and labeled properly and labeled in a systematic fashion. Before we leave this page, though, I, I want to comment on two emerging trends that the library is mindful of and aware of, and that is the use of preprints as a mechanism for communication about important findings in science, as well as the importance of having novel retrieval and search strategies available. The literature is growing rapidly, and with our new modes of scientific communication, such as preprints, we are expanding even more quickly the number of different places a particular finding is reported. What the NLM has done in support of the NIH's plan to allow preprints to be supported as, and submitted as evidence of a interim product of research is we now allow for the acquisition and indexing of literature, excuse me, of preprints generated through NIH funded support and deposited in, in known, art, known preprint servers such as BioArchives to be also indexed and deposited through PubMed Central. So we are improving the access to the, the literature, whether it be in the preprint or the archival form. What we recognize is the literature is now changing, so we're moving from a version of record to records of version. With respect to our resources in finding, we are in, in experimenting with new approaches to machine learning, natural language processing, so that the retrieval of the literature brings back to the user the most relevant, most likely to be useful components of the literature. This is raising a lot of new questions for us. What does reliability mean when we use a relevance-based ranking of our research res research results ordering? How do we demonstrate stability and access to the literature? So I, I come with good news and bad news. The literature is expanding. Self-correction is an increasingly challenging concept. Next slide, please. Let me talk a little bit about two of our specialty resources that I mentioned so far, and that is the clinicaltrials.gov repository. For those of you who are not familiar with clinicaltrials.gov, it is a registry of clinical trials globally, clinical trials done in the U.S. that are either funded by the NIH or in support of FDA applications must be registered here, but we accept all types of registration. Currently, there are almost 400,000 different studies registered here. Some of these are active, some of these are, are completed studies. In addition to uh, allowing for the registration of a study, we also uh, provide the results of studies required in some cases by the FDA and the NIH requirement. Optional others, we provide summary results, which means that even if a study never reaches an archival publication, the results of that study are available in a public repository that can be searched. Next, please. The challenge that we have, though, is to link these together, and we have a vision of the clinicaltrials.gov record as a scaffold of information about clinical trials. So the, the, the clinical trials registration number becomes a pathway to interconnect study protocols, statistical analysis pr protocols, and other documents, as well as publications, database entries, abstracts, and uh, research uh, clinical service, sorry, clinical data research forms, and ultimately individual participant data, which will likely be held in repositories outside of the NIH. What we're doing is to make science self-correcting is to provide the pathways to all of the places that a particular study may have evidence, so that when corrections have to be made, or when transparency is required, we are able to show that. Next slide. Beginning in the clinical environment, though, we recognize that having common standard ways of labeling phenomenon will enhance the rigor and reproducibility of research and reduce our need to make corrections because of problems with labeling or identifying phenomenon. On the screen in front of you, you see a five-step process that begins with a patient phenomenon characterizing that phenomenon using clinical terminology, organizing that phenomenon under something referred to as the USCDI or the United States Core Data for Interoperability, 
transmitting that data in a messaging standard or messaging structure called FHIR that ultimately gets it to a research record, which then feeds into the scientific communication process. But we believe that by supporting the terminologies and the transport of clinical data into the research record, we are improving the ability to create strong science and managing upstream the complexities that might lead to later needs for correction. The NLM specifically supports national access free of charge to clinical terminology such as SNOMED, the standard nomenclature of, of medicine, RxNorm, a clinical a pharmacological database, and LOINC, the logical observations, interventions, and codes for laboratory studies. By providing these tools at the very beginning, Clinics, hospitals, and researchers can code their data in a way that is systematic and ultimately improves the stability of science and it's our ability to understand and trust results. Next slide, please. The unique challenges that the National Library of Medicine addresses under this, this concept of scientific communication are on the left-hand side to promote the discovery, dissemination, and preservation of the literature, and on the right-hand side to ensure its accuracy, it's accountability and attribution. We have to continually build new ways to do this. Attributing a data set to a particular individual or demonstrating the accountability for a change in a clinical and a research record is work that the National Library of Medicine does in building the infrastructure to support self-correcting science. Last slide, please. I want to remind you that the National Library of Medicine serves as a trusted resource. We continue to want to be a partner in the creation of and the trust in science around the country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patty. That was wonderful. We really appreciate your uh, quick tour of a wonderful resource that we all use every day. <clears throat> Our last speaker is Dr. Jeffrey Peters. <clears throat> and Dr. Peters is well known to most of the people in this audience because he's a distinguished professor of medicine, molecular uh, toxicology and carcinogenesis at Penn State University. And he's also the deputy director of the Penn State uh, Cancer Institute, uh, as well as um, the associate director of the Center for Molecular Toxicology and Car Carcinogenesis. Dr. Peters has served on many, many editorial boards, and he's currently editor-in-chief of Toxicologic Sciences, the official journal of the Society of Toxicology. He's also received a number of uh, awards, including the Society of Toxicology's uh, Achievement Award, the NIH Director's Wednesday Afternoon Lecture, and the Huck Award for Outstanding Achievements in Life Sciences Research. Dr. Peters has performed seminal research focused on the biological role of peroxisome of, um, proliferator activated receptors in disease, PPARs. Um, Dr. Peters, give us your views. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dwyer. That was, thank you for the kind uh, introduction. And I also would thank the, uh, the organizers as well uh, for inviting me for this presentation. I feel kind of humbled. Um, in the spirit of this presentation, I, I feel kind of uh, strange because I feel that um, my presentation might be a little duplicative of the four previous presentations. So I want to make that note, but I didn't, I promise you that this is what I'm going to present is all for me, uh, but it's going to echo and sound very similar to what we, we, we just heard from the previous speakers. And I would just say also that um, I agree completely with <laughs> almost wholeheartedly with the first four speakers and I don't really don't need to say much more, but I will continue with my presentation and, and start here. So. I'm going to give you, uh, first my disclosures, uh, I am on the editorial board of Toxicological Sciences. Um, I'm on the editorial board of JVC as well. And my research does focus on PPRs, which I will talk about today and how they function. Um, so what I wanted to talk very briefly, I am known for brevity and I'm also known for being concise. I wanted to give you my own personal perspective and the impact of, of this issue that we're talking about today. And then I wanted to talk about an example from toxicological sciences that I've had to deal with since taking on this job only recently. Um, and then just very briefly to touch on taking responsibility, which I think has been touched on by all the previous speakers and we can move directly into the uh, discussion section. So my personal perspective is that, um, you know, in, incorrect, in, incorrect research can impact your, your career and, and, and your the way things go for you. So, 
I'll, I'm going to give a brief dis discussion or uh, illustrate that in April 2008, this paper came out by a group and they uh, indicated that this phenomenon uh, activating this receptor that I study uh, decreased this um, tumor suppressor. And because of that, it implied that this protein act as, uh, was promoting a lung cancer. And it was uh, something that we were studying at the same time. And I'm going to flip to this one and just say that we we were on this study. We were looking at this these kinds of things for quite some time. And we couldn't understand why we didn't see these results. We were, we were unable to repeat them. We did a lot more rigorous analysis than what was provided in the original study. And at the end of the day, in September of that same year, we published our paper neg with the negative results, uh, showing that we we couldn't reproduce these findings. And uh, you know, they weren't in a higher impact, high impact journal, but they uh, they did they did demonstrate that we were unable to do this, and that was important. Um, but that we did spend a lot of money doing that. And I think that was an important part of what we're talking about here is that when we find findings in the literature. And, we, and we're trying to reproduce them, we, we run into issues in the laboratory. And so it turns out that, well, actually, I should go back, sorry, pre previous slide, that, that that figure that I showed you was actually reproduced in several papers that, that were published prior to that one paper. So in that work, um, if you look at this, this came out later after, the, this was this was beyond post-2008, it was also post-paper, but we published um, refuting that that work from that group. But if you look, someone else found out that critical examination that the, the same data was presented in three different papers. And so you've seen these before examples like this. I don't need to really, people that are in the audience will understand what I'm talking about, but you can see clearly that the examples with the arrows drawn, that the, the figure is the exact, it's essentially the same figure. It's been used three times, <laughs> three different, it's in, it's three different, three different treatments, two different proteins, but it's essentially just duplicated data. And so. You know, the, the long end of that one was that it ended up that the papers were retracted and that some of these things were retracted and because of that, but that doesn't really solve the problems we've been talking about because this is in 2012 when this occurred. So I think I heard this earlier, well, I did hear it earlier, that it takes time. And during this time, you know, we're we're trying to figure out what's going on and this took quite a long time for this to happen. So I echo what was said earlier that it's frustrating for investigators like myself or others um, when this, this information is out there. So, and another point that was made by um, Marsha earlier was that, you know, the refractive paper, and also by David, is that these papers continue to get cited. And the same thing is true in my field, is that papers, and I, I would add to that note, is that experts in the field are citing the papers. It's not just everybody, it's the experts that study these proteins in my field cite papers that were retracted. And that's a problem because people read those papers and think that these things are real. So it's it's an issue that has to be dealt with. And so. What do you do when you're faced with questionable data in the published literature? I, I would echo what David had said that I've been through similar situations with myself, with uh, ORI and other, other editors, and and found um, similar experiences that he said. Um, and then when you make accusations that lead, but what typically leads to, and what I experience is that it typically leads to um, investigations at institutions, which then happens at. So then at, at the end of the, the end result was is that you end up getting retractions, but these retractions, as we've heard today. They have very level, varying levels of explanations. They have varying levels of satisfaction, if you will, from both a you know, an, as a reader as well as an author as well as an investigator. So, from from an editor in chief perspective, addressing David's comments, I think that what do you do when you're an editor when you face with questionable date, date in the published literature? I can tell you that when I interviewed for this position, um, I had thought about this quite a bit. I think about it. I thought about it for other reasons because of my personal experience. Um, and I knew that tox toxi, we follow COPE guidelines, and that's still the standard for us right now. Someone mentioned that earlier as well. Um, I believe that was Brian. And while we follow these guidelines, we're we're still I, I'm, one of the things I'm when I was reading through those is that you actually need to look at your journal and actually look at the policies that are in place. And having said that, and that's something that we really need to do carefully for all journals, and and, and not necessarily adopting just uniform guidance. I think there be need some some differences there. So, th so what I want to talk about now is what we did, or what happened to us, or what happened to me. I should say when this did happen, and I did get a letter, and this was in 2019, right after I took over, and the it, this was pretty clear. It was a simple. This was a simple simple task. So Dave, I mean, so David will kind of may, may take issue with this one, but. The fact is that I was approached from the University of Kentucky. They, they had done an investigation. They told us that uh, their investigation found that this paper was plagiarized, that was duped, fabricated, and they gave us an explanation which was put at the bottom of this, this email that was sent to me. So the, the, the investigation had taken place. There really wasn't much to do other than to 
follow through with the guidelines, which is what takes the time. So you have to contact the authors and find out what goes on. So, you know, we prepared a retraction notice. Uh, we talk, then, then you have to contact the authors, which we did. And I, we heard this earlier today where some of the authors agree or disagree. Um, and that's what happened with us as well. Some of them agreed, some of them disagreed, some of them didn't respond. And then you print up the retraction article and you put it up there and you stick it on your website and PubMed notes it as well as we heard from the last speaker. And that's supposedly going to fix things and, and it does. And, and here we took care of it. So, so in response to David's comment that, you know, editors don't like to, don't always follow through. It's true they don't, and that's my experience as well, but I'm, I'm much the opposite. I, I tend to want to react to these things as long as we have the right necessary tools in place to do that. And I'll touch a little bit about that in a second. So we did retract this paper um, and it didn't take very long after the email came from, from the University of Kentucky and it's clearly marked and it's watermarked. And so we don't have any reason to believe that the people will be any uncertainty about this paper. But that being said, there's still the issue that we heard earlier that these papers could still potentially be cited by experts if they don't stay up with the literature or find out which papers are, are wrong or incorrect. So do retractions fix the science? I don't, you know, I don't, I, I don't think they do. Um, who was responsible for the data in the manuscripts? I think I heard earlier, and, and this is kind of falling back to, to the original talk we heard today from Marcia, and that is that, you know, really, I think ideally this, these issues and that we heard, ideally these things need to be taking, take place much earlier in the process. In the lab, when you're doing the research and the science, it seems to me that rigor and reproducibility need to be stressed in your lab much more. Um, and I think that's happening in many places. I know it is in our lab, but, but, and another thing that, that I would add to that is that in addition to the proactive approach that have been described by the, 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 the former panelists, I would add that writing systematic reviews or comprehensive reviews that address both sides of the story are an approach that might help you if you run across issues like this, because it has helped our field, at least it helped us somewhat, at least in being able to pr provide information out there to let people that are uninformed look at the information that's out there and make a judgment call for themselves. So that's another approach. And I'll end with this last slide with really more questions about that, but you know, are there time limits on retractions? How far back do you go? You know, what's the most suitable approach which we've heard about before? And I thought this third one that I put up there really more for discussion more than anything was the, we've heard about this today. What infrastructure do we need to have in place at journals? We don't, I mean, I run the journal from where I'm sitting and on, you know, I do my work from home. That's what I'm supposed to do. I don't have, and I have a, a managing editor here. I don't have a team of individuals in place or an infrastructure in place to screen manuscripts. Um, I have a keen eye and I have great editorial boards, but I don't have a, a great infrastructure for this kind of a thing. And this is something that's very concerning to me. And, I, and I'm interested to hear from others to see what we have available for that. And so uh, finally, I would just ask issue the last part also is the, the pre-publication issue, which are not going to be incorporated. National Library of Medicine is another issue because sometimes there are issues with those papers that get straightened up and that might be introducing something else we need to discuss. So I think I'm going to finish there and I stop and I'll be welcome for questions and I will end it with that. So thank you for the time and I appreciate that. Thanks so much, Jeff. Could everybody turn their cameras on because we're going to go now to the discussion. Um, and don't forget uh, to submit your questions on the WebEx platform and raise your hand if you wish to make a comment verbally. Jeff, before um, uh, you, you get a cup of coffee or something, let me just ask you, mention two things. You mentioned COPE, which stands for Council of on Publication Ethics. And if you could just mention what that is. And also you mentioned something that I think was very important in my career. And that was the mentors, the people I trained with, um, they were, they, they gave an example of ethics and not shortcutting and publishing false things uh, that seemed very important. And then there were also two people at NIH who weren't necessarily doing what maybe their supervisors wanted, but some of you on the, in the audience may remember uh, Ned Fader and Wally Stewart, who long before uh, this symposium were out there snooping around um, and uh, revealing some of the problems in the literature. So I, I there were two questions, Johanna, but I, and the second one I caught was the mentoring, which I and I recall that one yeah. because Frank, I worked in Frank Gonzalez's lab, and and he taught I went to the National Cancer Institute was taught very stringently that if you cannot hang your hat on the data, 
don't go forward. So that reproducibility issue that that was brought up by Brian about having to be able to reproduce it internally in our lab, we've been trained that you don't go on until you've reproduced it yourself. You, it, you're not comfortable if it hasn't been done over and over again. So that ethic was, was I had that for quite some time. And I, I teach that in my lab very much so. And I agree with what was said earlier by Marsha that that comment is very important. The first, the first question though, I, you, I got lost. What was the first question? Again, Mark? Basically just the, uh, the ethics of example of mentors and supervisors who, who don't cheat, who don't try to go for the high impact journal with something that's really not ready uh, and so forth. It, it seemed to me that that's a critical thing. If it, it is if a if it if it's broke you can't if it if it's broken you got you can't fix it easily it is correct and i'll let someone else chime in here i, I think I... i'll set david so i want to uh try to dispute what i think is a false dichotomy that's often offered in the dialogue on rigor reproducibility and transparency and so on in science and i think we, it's often portrayed as though there's this dichotomy between trying to be rigorous and honest and trying to have exciting, impactful results. And I think those are not two ends of a continuum. Those are two different dimensions. And one can be rigorous and aim for high impact and exciting findings. One can reward rigor and also reward high impact, exciting efforts and high impact and exciting findings, even if those findings are the result of random luck, right? Brian and I both do the same study. He gets lucky and finds a great result. I don't get lucky and don't find it. And you might say, does he deserve a reward more than me? And I would argue whether he deserves it or not, it's good if he gets it because it will promote the field. Now, at the same time, just as we have in the Olympics now, we say, we want the best gymnasts and the fastest runners and the strongest weightlifters. And that's what we're going to reward, not just what kind of outfit you wear, but we will reward it only if you pass a drug test that shows you didn't cheat. And so I think we need to separate out this idea. We need to say, yes, we will reward rigor. Yes, we will promote rigor, but that does not mean we will stop promoting and rewarding or should stop promoting and rewarding the incredible, impactful, novel, exciting, beautiful findings. Thanks, David. That's a good thought. Uh, we have a question that came in from uh, Dr. Bueller about um, Jenga. Back to you, uh, Marsha, and your Jenga slide. Using that example, he, uh, he wanted you to focus on individual studies and in particular access to the underlying raw data. Do you have any advice on how to address situations where an interested party is questioning the scientific consensus and decision, but doesn't have access to the underlying uh, raw data. For example, uh, an NGO questioning a regulatory decision, but the underlying raw data is proprietary and owned by the manufacturer um, that is not open by design. Do you have any thoughts there, Marcia? Um, sure. I mean, this is a really difficult question because there are uh, a number of reasons why raw data might not be available. One is in uh, human health. Uh, there's certain privacy um, reasons why that, that raw data can't be made available. Very often, forms of the data can be made available that de-identify, but as you know, there's even difficulty in trying to guarantee de-identification uh, in a data set because often it can be matched with something else and suddenly uh, identities are revealed. Um, I would say that uh, typically um, a scientific consensus that might be used in the regulatory regime would not be, or at least I hope it would not be, approved by an agency unless they could get uh, access to the data um, if it's industry data even on a confidential basis. And I know that there have been cases where um, industry has been willing to um, let the data be used um, by uh, an agency in a confidential way. 
Um, I, I think the importance is that we just hold regulatory agencies to their feet to the fire to say um, that you should not just base uh, a regulation on a paper that's published um, that you haven't actually seen the data or that people you trust haven't seen the data and said, yes, indeed, this is um, a consensus here. Um, I really don't know, or I can't name, for example, any um, regulation that was based solely on one study, even if um, it was largely based on one study, but usually there are attempts to uh, verify the information. Thanks, Marcia. Um, I think Sheila Jasanoff has written some interesting books on this. Mm -hmm. They might be worth uh, taking a look at. We have a question. Could I Marcia. also just add a little bit? Sure, uh, absolutely. Please, just extending uh, Marcia's comment. It's often people think uh, dichotomously about data sharing, right? It's open or it's closed. But of course, there are lots of opportunities for levels in between those that can address some of the uh, provisions and concerns, both about intellectual property uh, and uh, sensitive health information. Uh, one level that's obvious is shared with permission. So if you meet these particular regulations, then we'll uh, be able to give you the data. Uh, a second level down is data enclaves, which are becoming more uh, popular, where you never get access to the data yourself. It's protected, but you just submit your analysis protocols uh, to, and then get the results returned. And then there's some horizon opportunities that really uh, push the boundaries for how we could manage both security uh, and maximizing uh, reproducibility. And that's injecting small amounts of error into the original data set that doesn't destroy the covariance matrix of the relations among the variables, but does make it impossible to extract back what the original data uh, were. So all of these, I think, are are technological opportunities to try to meet some of the standards uh, that Marsha had laid out there. Anybody else have any comments on that one? Okay, let's go on to the next question here. Uh, this is from Dr. Wolf. Um, he says, it seems under the current system, much of the onus is on the individual researcher for due dil diligence on references. I was wondering, what do the panels panelists see as the responsibility of search engines, such as PubMed or Google Scholar, to clearly indicate when a publication has been retracted and why, or if it has been retracted by one journal but still was published someplace else. Retracted papers are still findable, and in some cases, as pointed out by the presenters, are referenced without uh, qualification. Patty, do you have anything? I, I think you spoke to that in your talk about uh, PubMed and some of your efforts. I have a, a couple of comments, yes. And as we were- uh, Can you speak up a little bit? Your oh, mic is- I'm sorry. Um, am I, is this better? Yes. yes. Um, I have a couple of comments. Um, as we were speaking, I, I, was, I, I was quickly looking around to see how we're handling the paper that Marsha referred to earlier. And, and I found very nice banners of, of saying this paper has been retracted in the National Library of Medicine's resources in um, uh, ResearchGate. But when I looked at, um, uh, it, when we looked a little broader in the Cochrane collaboration, for example, the paper is still listed without its retraction notice, and it's possible to get to the paper directly um, through a, a server at Princeton. So there's there, the, the, the challenge of, of perpetuating the status of a paper and its integrity remains an important both technological and political challenge. From our perspective, I, I will tell you that we work closely with the journals to make sure that we're, we're adhering to their expectations and their um, communications about this. We require that there be a citable uh, retraction notice when it comes through. We have an opportunity here to think about new ways of creating tools for, if you will, the ethical conduct of science and correction by, for example, periodically sending out web crawlers that as retracted papers are, are retracted to find every possible source and try to track them down and follow up with them. But I would say the same situation will happen as was described earlier with authors deciding that they would prefer not to retract a paper, journals deciding that 
the publishing of a paper is a contractual relationship with the subscriber and therefore to retract a paper means they're changing a contractual relationship. So the idea of even if you could locate all the possible instances of a paper, it still may not be possible to make them all disappear. I would welcome the comments of the, the panel or others about how the NLM could be more helpful in this area. Anybody else have an item they want to speak? Marsha. Yeah, I just wanted to comment, just give a, a perfect example of this. Um, once at Science, the um, uh, Science Magazine and the American Chemical Society um, simultaneously flagged a paper that was plagiarized by taking parts of papers that had been published in Science and in um, the Journal of the American Chemical Society, putting those two pieces of paper together and publishing them in a third journal. So uh, together, Science and ACS uh, went forward to this journal and said, this paper's plagiarized, you have to retract it. Well, what the journal did was rather than retracting it, they just pulled it off their server and had a gap in page numbers in that <laughs> issue which was absurd. And not only that, the paper didn't die with that because there had been so many mirrors of it that it popped up on various websites around the world that we were just playing whack-a-mole trying to get rid of that paper. Yeah. Uh, it, it's really difficult. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, here we have a lot. Uh, Jeff? Oh, no, who is it? Uh, Brian? Yeah, and then David. Yeah, this, and this is a really important question of, of who's responsible and how much can the authors actually manage understanding the basis of all of these citations and how the technology can make that easier. To put it in the broader lens, right, retraction is one of uh, the extreme examples. Is that paper even still in the literature? But of course, we all recognize that the there's varying confidence in all papers that still belong in the literature. Yeah, we don't believe that result anymore, but how is it that each individual researcher knows uh, we don't have confidence in those outcomes and we do have confidence in these outcomes? And this just, you know, expands the problem writ large is how false facts, as it were, continue to perpetuate uh, in the literature. And one of the horizon possibilities for addressing that is a uh, being tackled in a, a DARPA program called SCORE that uh, our group is part of, but it's a number of different groups that are contributing to this. And the goal of the SCORE program is to create uh, automated indicators of credibility of papers and findings. So can we get the machines to actually give us scores of how much confidence should you have uh, in this paper as an initial heuristic for people to say, oh, wait a second, maybe I should look a little closer uh, at that paper, or maybe we should invest a little more in trying to reproduce those findings to gain confidence. Now, how far that can be pushed in terms of valid indicators of scores isn't yet known, but the early evidence suggests that we may be able to develop uh, some effective technologies to help guide some of that for the readers uh, as they're figuring out what parts of the literature are presently perceived as trustworthy and where we need to look more closely. Good on you. That's great. David, you want to make a comment? Yeah, I want to return a little bit to the idea of you know, sometimes journals or other organizations, you know, uh, Dr. Brennan from the NLM indicating the challenge in trying to know what they can, where their leverage points are, is that I think academic freedom is extremely important and we don't want to ever compromise it. Uh, we see lots of situations where people speak out against the dogma and at one point they may be labeled cranks and then let later points you say, hey, you know, maybe that's not so cranky after all. I mean, we're dealing with that now with COVID-19, where something's labeled a crank idea at one point, and, you know, six, 12 months later, we say, maybe it, that, that has validity. So I think academic freedom is important. Or maybe it doesn't. <laughs> maybe it doesn't, we, it, but, it, you know, need, the question needs to be asked. Um, I think that um, First Amendment rights are absolutely vital, uh, strong support. We don't want to ever compromise those. But those rights, as we know, don't extend to anybody saying anything under any circumstance, as we all know from slander and libel laws, uh, hate speech issues, and so on. And the rights to speak and the rights to all other things are not the same. And so while someone may have a right to their opinion and to express their opinion, 
doesn't mean they have a right to express it in a particular journal or on a particular university's website or to not have their granting agency come out and say, we've done an investigation and the author is just plain wrong. His or her data don't support the conclusion he's drawing and that's an inappropriate conclusion. And I think we need to, to not be shy about that. We need to accept our responsibility and our rights for speech as a way of countering others. And so some of those papers that I've talked about, for example, where I said, look at how these are not corrected. We could say the author maybe wants to stand by them and that's fine, but where's the granting agency? Where was the USDA on the one that was funded by the USDA to come out and say, it's not okay that our grantee has put the statement out and it's not corrected. Thank you. Um, well, we always have to guard against those things and also, of course, false equivalents. Um, some a question uh, that uh, I think Dr. Jones, Wen Jones, who's um, at IFANS, asked uh, is uh, what role COPE could have in supporting corrections and retractions and whether COPE should be granted more genuine oversight. COPE, as I understand it, but maybe some of the rest of you uh, uh, could could speak better about it. I think it's funded largely by um, publishers, isn't it? And it, the Council on uh, Publication Ethics, and I've come in contact with it with case studies they've done that have been very helpful to me. But I wonder if anyone has any ideas about how COPE could expand, um, Brian or Patty or any of you, Dr. Peters. I know you use it a lot. Well, our, that's that's the guidelines that we use. Yeah. Um, they they're helpful. Their website is very useful. Um, in hindsight, they have a great they have some great information for when you're about to take over a journal. Um, what what you should do. And I've been reading that a lot lately in pre preparation for this. But it's not that we we have done a lot of the things that are listed on there. But they do provide a lot of information about. Um, mechanisms that should be in or procedures that should be in place, you know, for your journal specifically to address these issues and specific, you know, criteria. everything has to be mapped out. And I, and the way I look at it is there's a lot of work to be done in that area. And especially after hearing from some of the other speakers, because there are many ways that this can occur. Um, I, I think that COPE has a lot of information that's very useful. Um, but I'm not quite 100% certain about the question was, should we give them more uh, yeah. Oversight, I'm not certain about that. I think the oversight belongs with, I, I, I agree with the comment about the author, the authors early on and the, trying to correct it early, um, but editors at the end of the day, at the end of the day are also responsible too. So I'll, I'll let someone else speak now. Good point. I, I would just say this, this would be uncope like for them yeah. to yeah. Uh, take on something like that. Cope strength has been in its, um, examination of case histories in its suggestions of best practices, but it is not an oversight body. And so yeah. this just sounds uncope like to me. Yeah, uh, I would agree. Brian. Just to extend that a little bit, there may be a middle ground that could be really useful, uh, which is some active coaching. I think a lot of, especially academic editors that are doing this for a term limited period of editing, just feel totally unprepared. Like, I don't know how to deal with this. And so a lot of the issues that uh, David and uh, Jeff had raised of just some avoidance because of it being so uncertain, have COPE or a COPE-like body uh, that is actively available for, here's the process and let's help walk you through it, uh, would, could be very beneficial for the community. Thank you. Um, let me throw out two things. First of all, um, if you haven't looked in your chat, Harvey Feinberg wrote something with David, I guess, uh, on the use and misuse of um, transparency in research, science and rulemaking in the Environmental Protection Agency. And that appeared in JAMA last year, if anybody's interested. And also Sheila Jadzinoff has written a lot about this and she's written some very interesting things. Um, secondly, let me just throw out to everybody, um, how can we destigmatize these retractions and incur, uh, you know, really encourage author engagement in the corrections process in the case of honest errors? Because right now, um, 
it, it's bad on you and you, you know, it's something that most people don't want to do. Johanna, I'd like to, to try to link that question with the previous conversation about COPE. Uh, I true. I really COPE is a very exciting asset in society. And I think they're focused on things such as conflict of interest and the issue of multiple journals, as we heard earlier, has really provided an, an independent body or, or attention to this. They are a publisher forum. And and so we have we do have to think about motivation the same with our our professional societies and the same with with nonprofits. So we have to recognize that there is a there is a business model underlying a lot of this that may that may need to be taken into consideration. But I I want us to to re, to actually not let the researchers and the investigators off the hook too much. They need to be picking the right outlets to publish in publishing in not just high impact so you'll get a tenure case but high quality journals with good editorial practices that have transparencies that require the investigators to present their data along with their findings are actually one way to move the correction process upstream. Helping our scientists pick the right outlets to publish in is something that the NIH has already started to do, not by whitelisting or blacklisting journals. We're not going to do that, but we do say look for a journal that has characteristics that are going to lead to high problem, high probability of a proper editorial process that will get your materials available. Uh, we're also providing that same kind of guidance for picking data repositories now as we have see increasingly the impetus, the impetus to attach data to research papers, having, <coughs> excuse me, access to repositories that follow high quality practices of preservation, of identi identity management, of non-disclosure, of investigator use of data, these are all really requiring that we realize it's a new publication environment in 2021. It's not like it was even 15 years ago. Thank you. Good points. Anybody else have a want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I think uh, it's very important. I, I just wanted to bring up something that I haven't heard, but it's really bothered me a lot. And that is the whole issue of predatory publishing and people finding, I think, uh, David showed a slide where something got published in one of these lookalike journals um, that may have been predatory. I don't know if it was where the paper was just lifted and put into another. Um, and th that bothers me a lot. I don't know if there's anything that can be done about these journals, but there are hundreds of them now. Yeah, Marcia. So, um, you know, I, I I love the statement before about really encouraging authors to publish in journals that have standards and that have, you know, a good uh, peer review processes and that um, work to correct the record when necessary. Um, the problem is we we love to um, dump on the predatory journals, but let's face it, they have a following out there. There are so many faculty members at um, uh, small regional colleges and other places who are pressured by their administration to have X number of publications a year and for, in order to uh, continue to advance in their careers. And the people who are looking at these publications just check the box. They don't even look at whether they're quality publications. And so if you are a faculty member under that kind of pressure, you've got an enormous teaching load. You just have to show evidence of publication. These predatory journals look like a win for you. You don't really want reviews. You don't really want someone to tell you you have to do something over again or fix it or be better. You just want to check the box. And so we've created this whole group of people who are um, uh, mutually supporting and dependent on these predatory journals. Very good point. And this can be made worse in some countries where I, I learned in a country in Asia uh, that you got much more credit if you had a single author on a paper. And if you had a string of authors, like a statistician and some of the other things that most papers need today, um, you were marked down in terms of your publications for uh, tenure and so forth. So the two were a lethal combination together, really a bad, a bad sort of thing. Uh, let me ask another broad question. Um, what kinds of data do we need for journalists or journals and scientists to trust 
that more transparent and expeditious processes aren't going to harm their careers and impact factors. We're right back to what Marsha was just talking about. I'm, I'm sitting here in Boston within shooting distance of a lot of places where there's a lot of publisher parish pressure here, as well as at small community colleges. So I'll just say a couple things on that, Joanna. First of all, I love how many universities today are not sending out full CVs when they're asking for input on promotion and tenure cases. They're asking instead, they're going back to the um, a candidate and saying, um, just take a few of your most impactful studies, um, provide um, links or sometimes even journal de-identified information on the publication and why you chose this for its significance. And uh, that really um, uh, encourages the reviewers um, of the case, the referees, to look carefully at what was actually done and what its impact has been. And I think we have to get away from this numbers game and more to an impact game. Great. Anybody else? Brian, you got any thoughts on that? Sure, on the on the general point you raised on people's concerns about adopting some of these transparency and rigor behaviors, uh, there are a lot of reasonable, practical concerns that get raised uh, that do need to be answered. Very few people disagree with the ideals. Like it's hard to be a scientist and say I don't believe in transparency. Like it just there, most of the basic ideals uh, are endorsed by virtually everyone. Where it gets challenging is on pragmatics. No one else is doing it. It's hard to do. I'm already busy. This is a lot of extra work. It's unrewarded. And in fact, I might lose ground uh, if I do it. And so those partially can be addressed with some simple education campaigns. So, for example, there is widespread concern in communities that haven't adopted preprints widely that by sharing a preprint, I will get scooped. Uh, but there are also other communities that have been doing preprints for decades, physics being the most uh, mature in this regard, where it becomes very clear that once you post the preprint, priority is established because <laughs> you are the first one to post it publicly. And the experience just means, oh, okay, that doesn't actually happen much in practice, but people are reluctant because they haven't had the practice in doing it. And the same thing is true for data sharing, for registration, all of the different behaviors we talk about for promoting transparency and rigor. Uh, there are reasonable questions to ask. And there's existing evidence about uh, them in practice. But of course, everybody says, but it's different in my field. It's different where we do our work. Yeah. And that does require incremental steps uh, for culture change. We can't just say it works over there. So just do it. What we need to do is get the various stakeholders in that community to say, well, let's experiment with it, right? No one in our community is against experimentation. Let's do a pilot. <laughs> let's try it out. Uh, let's see what happens. And then we'll get evidence in that experience. And then those, and having seen this happen a number of times, almost all of the objections melt away because people realize, oh, yeah, actually, this is why I got into science is to do it like this. This is great. Uh, but it does take that exposure in a way that is feels like this is my field and the way that we do our work. <laughs> Very good. Uh, let's talk a little bit um, about fostering a, a culture of, of self-correction a little bit more. Um, and Brian, this sort of as a follow-up, but for everybody, uh, carrots are always better than sticks, but rigor often loses out to sensationalism in academe. And are the sticks also necessary to encourage rigor? And if so, what might might the sticks be? And how do we balance the sticks and the carrots? Because we talked about not enough carrots uh, as well. This, this is a good question and a hard one. Uh, I, I am very much a carrot oriented uh, change agent myself. So I, I love the carrot. Uh, nevertheless, you are correct that if the system does not have all of the mechanisms for detection and correction of misbehavior, 
then some stick oriented solutions end up being essential, right? Because you can't, if you can't, if there are ways to game the system, given the design of the system, then you have no mechanisms other than sticks at the end to address the gaming uh, problems, especially the problematic parts. But to what extent do we actually need that? That's not at all clear, I don't think, uh, in the present system. And it goes back to something that Marcia said in the opening presentation, which is if you make the right thing to do easier than gaming, than doing it the wrong way, then you're just people are just going to do the right thing. Uh, and so innovations in technology, innovations in process, innovations in transparency can all work in the same direction of it's actually easier for me to do the work transparently and as rigorously as I can than to try to fake it. So I might as well just actually do the work. <laughs> so I think that is, un there, I, I don't think we know what the limit is there to know if we have to impose some strong sticks as well. I'm curious if others have different, different Anybody else have a stick? David? You're muted. I think you're and, still uh, muted. Forgive me, to avoid being um, dichotomous, it's not just carrots and sticks. I, and I would say that, you know, we need sticks, carrots, gates, tools, and vaccines. Sticks and carrots, we've heard a little discussion of. I think both are necessary. That's the reality. Um, I think that um, Brian's talked a lot about tools. Let's give people the tools to make it easier. Um, I think the idea of vaccines, that's to me enculturation. That's uh, character development. That's saying, can we raise up a group of scientists? And I don't know, this is an empirical question, who are so committed to the unvarnished communication of truth that to do otherwise is just anathema to their spirit. And so to me, that's, that's the idea of vaccines, of, of building people who want to do the right thing. And then I would say the, the last part is the gates. And that's things like IRB and other sort of levers, which ultimately have sticks behind them, but which sort of usually long before you get to the sticks, say you can't even start the study if you don't go to the IACUC or the IRB and they will put some boundaries around what you can do. You can't even submit to our journal if you haven't registered in this way or what have you. So I think those five tools, sticks, carrots, gates, tools, and vaccines are a broader uh, portfolio. Good. Oh, well, let's go back to Brandolini's law, which I think is absolutely fantastic. I think it was Brian, you talked about Brandolini's law. And for those who didn't hear, it's the amount of energy needed to refute bullshit is an order of magnitude greater than uh, larger than than what it takes to produce it. And uh, the Center for Open Sciences Registers Report model uh, seems very well equipped to prevent some of the BS, uh, the substandard methods, the weak science, underpowered designs, et cetera, from, from happening in the first place, Brian. But can you elaborate a little on what these registered reports uh, are and how many journals are implementing this model and who pays for that and so forth. Yeah, happy to. Uh, registered reports goes after what is that central incentive uh, for researchers, which is the publication. And in the standard model, what gets one that publication is often contingent, heavily or completely contingent on the outcomes, the results of the study. Were they interesting? Were they exciting? Were they positive? Uh, and so all of the incentives are make them interesting, exciting, positive outcomes uh, so I can get published. Registered reports makes one change to the model that is a fundamental change for considering for publication, which is you submit to the journal what you plan uh, to investigate. Here's my the question I'm interested, some background research on it, some initial experiments and evidence that I have some viable approach here, and here are my proposed critical experiments. The peer reviewers evaluate that. Nobody knows what the outcomes are and what they evaluate it based on to decide whether it should be in the journal is, is the question important and is the methodology an effective test of that question? And if it passes those two criteria, then the journal gives in principle acceptance uh, to this, the paper. It says, if you follow through with what you said you're gonna do, 
We have some outcome independent criteria to show that you did the research validly. Uh, if you do all of that, then we will publish regardless of outcomes. And that fundamentally changes the relationship between the author uh, and their work in terms of getting their rewards. It's no longer that I have to get certain kinds of outcomes. What I'm incentivized to do is ask the most important questions that I can and design the best tests of them. Uh, and so the experience with this in terms of the research literature is that it dramatically reduces publication bias. Negative results are much more likely to get published because no one knows what the results are beforehand. Uh, and we even have initial evidence that it improves the rigor of the methodology, the research itself, uh, doing it this model. And we, we can only speculate why, but the two obvious reasons are if I know that the reviewers are going to evaluate based on the quality methodology, then I'm going to pursue high quality methodology. And if peer reviewers who are experts in that field can actually review the methodology and make suggestions for improvement rather than just tell me what I did wrong in studies that are already completed, then I can actually improve the methodology through the peer review process. So it has lots of virtues conceptually. In practice, uh, there are a little bit over 300 journals that are using it so far. Uh, most of them are in the social and behavioral sciences and neuroscience with increasing adoption across different areas of life sciences. Uh, not so many yet uh, in the natural sciences, but a few are, are trying it. Uh, and there's a database accumulating of just experience with this model and the both anecdotal and empirical reports are very positive with initial experience. Reviewers say, my gosh, this is, this is so much better uh, than the other way. I get to comment on here's how you could do your work better uh, rather than, oh, here's all the things to do wrong. Now go send it to the next journal. So I'll, I'll pause there on that. Great. Uh, Patty, you have a comment. Well, I, I just, I like what Brian is, is saying because he's moving the concept of the literature from being a record of what was done to a conversation about what is coming. And that idea really fundamentally changes what the, the pub, what publication is all about. Now it's going to make, it's going to be somewhat nerve wracking for FDA submissions, for example, or someone who wants to know the truth about whether masks are going to prevent the, the spread of the coronavirus. And I think what we have to do is stop thinking the literature can do everything all the time and really look at, at using the literature for, the, if you will, purpose built for what we're trying to do. And I think getting good science and getting good knowledge into the world is what the base literature is for. And synthetic art, articles and, and, and comparative reviews are where we, we find the truth telling as uh, Marcia's Jenga um, uh, picture showed us. Thank you. Great. Great. Jeff, did you have a comment on that? Oh, I just followed along. I agree with what Brian was that said. It completely, I did nothing to add. Okay. Uh, we're up to 255. So I guess if we have to go off, oh, Marcia, go ahead. You're, you're muted. So I just had um, one quick um, caveat to um, the idea of the um, registered reports. Um, I think it's a really positive um, outcome and a good direction for much of the research that is um, very hypothesis driven and where um, uh, people uh, are, you know, doing experimentation, et cetera. Uh, I, I'd say that though much of the research in the environmental sciences, and this includes ecology and um, geophysics and oceanography and atmospheric sciences, a lot of it is very um, exploratory still because we're talking about often time scales and space scales that we can't do some definitive experiment in the lab. Uh, usually to get funding, we have to throw out some hypothesis of what we're trying to test. But in my experience as an oceanographer, what I actually found was never uh, something that um, I hi had hypothesized. And in fact, the earth was always far more interesting than my lame hypotheses. Uh, so it's not that I don't think this can't be used more generally. Um, I'm just not sure it really addresses issues in many of the environmental sciences. Thank you. Let me, um, because we've only got a few minutes left, let me ask a, a sort of final question to everybody and then you can 
pick it off as you want. A common theme today has been that the current environment incentivized getting it published and not getting it right. And what do you see each of you, I'm gonna ask each of you, as the most important or impactful thing we can do to shift from a culture of sensationalism uh, to foster an environment that builds a self-correction into the design of the science. So I have, I have I have a thought. Um, I I the one time when I've seen culture really changed in uh, academia is when NSF added its second criteria, the significance of the research to not only its intellectual um, importance. I think that NSF and other funding agencies could add a third criterion where they're asking what is being done in this research to encourage rigor, transparency, and validity um, of the results. And I think just forcing PIs to think seriously about it, build it into the design, and have it reviewed um, could be, uh, again, a shift in culture. Thank you. Good idea. Right on. Jeff? I would yes. echo Marsha. I don't need to repeat it. That's exactly, I mean, those are, that's what I've been thinking. That's exactly what I think about. Um, you, you put it in the perfect terms. It, it really belongs to the, early on. I, I really think that's a great idea. Those were great ideas. Get it in at the beginning. Patty? You're muted. This is perfectly consistent with the NIH's view that if the society pays for the science, they should understand and benefit from the science. This is not an indictment against basic research, but it is saying we need to understand the arc and its contribution to society. Translation as well as fundamental yep. principles. Uh, Brian. Just choosing one of the interventions, anything that promotes greater transparency of the entire research process, I think is necessary, not necessarily sufficient, but necessary for self-correction to occur more effectively. And this is along the lines of David's earlier point of you know, encouraging freedom of investigation and people pursuing what they wanna pursue and what way they wanna pursue it. We don't need to be prescriptive about that. But if they show us their work, then that self-corrective energy of science as a social enterprise we can actually function. And I think that's a key element for all of this to become more effective. Okay, David? I think there are, there are five, at least categories of things we need. There's okay. the sticks to not have people do, uh, or to discourage people from doing bad things carrots to encourage people to do good things, gates, those are things like IRB approvals, IA cooks, journal submission policies that don't allow you to even get in the, in the arena if you don't do the right thing first, tools, which are things like Brian creates that help make it easier for you to do the right thing, and then finally vaccines, which is character development, training, teaching you to do the right thing, making you the kind of um, scientist who feels a personal commitment to doing the right thing. Great. And I think I'd add to those five very good, succinct things, uh, uh, examples that people, children learn to walk by example. And I think all of us learn science. It's still a very much of a, an apprenticeship. And, and so we need to have good people leading uh, the field. And hopefully uh, in addition to the, wonderful people in, in the tax society. Uh, there are some wonderful people on this panel who are also mentors and exemplars to others. Uh, anything else that anyone wants to bring up? I think we've got all the questions answered. Kevin, are we up to time now? You are, yes. We are. Well, I'd just like to uh, thank everyone for a wonderfully stimulating uh, session. I, I think these live parts of it are the best parts of all, but we certainly heard some wonderful things uh, during the talks as well. So thank you to uh, iFans and to each of you for your afternoon, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend and uh, keep doing all you're doing so well. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your John. moderation. Thank, thank you. you. Moderation, Jonna. It's terrific. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Take care.